Let's pray together. Our Father, our world is a broken place. And even right here, we're surrounded by broken people. And we're broken. So for your grace, we are most grateful. And we come here this morning to remind ourselves that you are God and that in your presence, everything else comes into perspective. So now we pray, Lord, that the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts will please you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, it's, we're kind of like a family, right? Family of Jesus followers. It's kind of like God is our dad and we're his kids. So we're going to treat this morning kind of like a family meeting. Did your biological family ever have family meetings? Maybe your mom or dad laid down some of the family rules, you know, where you could go, what you could do, who you could hang with, kind of words you could use, that kind of stuff. Well, it's kind of like we're going to go over some of the Cap City family rules this morning because we are a family of Jesus followers. Dad's not here physically, but he left us with some pretty clear guidelines as to how he expects us to behave as Jesus followers. And some of these guidelines really look weird to our twisted little minds. And it's kind of like Dad is saying, just do it anyway. First, because I am like God. And second, because whether you understand it or not, it will make your life better. And it'll make you better out of life. So here's the Apostle Paul speaking for God. Ben kind of kicked off with these verses last week. Paul says, I plead with you guys to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifices, the kind that he finds acceptable. In other words, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for us, so we give ourselves back to him because of what God has done for us, which is a whole lot. We give ourselves back to him. And we do life his way because he's shown us what a well-lived life looks like. It's better. So we do life his way, not ours. His way is better. Hard sometimes, but better. It's a sacrifice. Sometimes sacrifices are hard And so he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. Don't do it like they do. Let God transform the way you think. Let him make you into a brand new person. In other words, don't live like they do, guys. Don't value what they value. Don't think like what they think. Don't behave like they behave. Because we're Jesus followers. We're different. And that's cool. The verses Ben and I are going to blow through this morning are kind of like family rules that make us different. These rules, these guidelines are not difficult to understand, but they're devilishly hard to live by. It wouldn't be hard to follow these rules if our hearts were pure. It wouldn't be hard to follow these rules if the people around us were pure, but they're not either. We're sinners. We're surrounded by sinners, right? Which means that we're going to push back on nearly every one of these rules. We're going to search for loopholes. Well, how about instead of looking for loopholes, what if we try to figure out how to obey? I know that some of these family rules are going to sound strange to our twisted little minds. But if you're a Jesus follower, do it anyway. If you're not a Jesus follower, some of this stuff is going to sound over the top weird to you. And you may be thinking, I don't want anything to do with this family. But listen in anyway. We think this is our God telling us what a life well-lived looks like, and they will work for you too. In the verses that we're going to cover, about 13 verses, I counted about 25 rules. That's a long sermon, right? Don't panic. We're not going to cover them all. We're only going to cover about 13 of them. 13-point sermon. That's out of control, isn't it? But here's what we're going to do to make it tolerable. Ben and I are going to have a timer a 90-second timer, and we've got 90 seconds to explain each rule. And that's it, right? Now, the rules are on a card that was next to your seat. You find it, 
You want to kind of follow along. We've left enough light that you can follow along. There should be a pencil in front of you. And what you want to do is this. We're going through a rule. If you need to make a note or two, go ahead. But the really important part is to the right of the rule, you'll see a little blank where it says grade yourself. Give yourself a score. You need to do it and you need to be honest. I don't care what kind of a scale you use. Maybe one if you're really doing poorly, 10 if you're doing great. Or give yourself an A all the way down to an F, right? But you need to keep score. I'll tell you why when we get to the end. So you ready? Here goes. Ben, take off. All right, number one, don't fake love. Paul starts with love, which is always the best place to start. Everything else that follows in this list as we go through these 13 is going to be commentary on what love looks like. Every other piece of instruction that we get from Paul in this family meeting only makes sense if it is done with love. And it only makes sense if it's done in view of God's mercy. And it only makes sense if we refuse to conform to the patterns of this world. And so he says love must be sincere which could be translated more literally as love without pretense or love without play acting. We've all heard the words, I love you, and then watched actions that don't match. It's hurtful. Paul says don't do that. Love in a sincere way. And the word that Paul uses is agape. This isn't sweet, sappy, romantic love. This is thick-skinned love. This is resilient, enduring love. It's a love that does what is best for the other, not the self. This is a love that does what is best in God's eyes, not your eyes. Sometimes agape love happens at your own expense. Don't minimize the idea of love as simply being a feeling. This is actions of love, even if the feelings are absent. In fact, Agape is best proven when feelings are absent. The command to love assumes you will be called to love those who are unlovable. It assumes that people are hard to love. Do it anyway. It's why Jesus can say things like, love your enemies. It doesn't make sense unless it's an action and a decision beyond your feelings. Love must be sincere. How are you doing with that? Give yourself a grade. He went long. I nailed it. He went long. It. Got it. Give yourself a score, guys. <laughs> Number two, hate what is evil, hold tightly to what is good. Now, these are very strong words. God doesn't tell us to dislike evil. He tells us to hate it like he does. And he doesn't tell us just to prefer the good. He tells us to cleave to it, cling to it, hang on to it fiercely like he does. And that's hard for us. We prize tolerance. We don't want to call things good or evil, right or wrong, black or white. We're not comfortable with binary options like those. In fact, our culture says that if you love somebody, you have to accept what they accept. Our culture says that just because it's wrong for you doesn't it mean that it's wrong for me. But guys, we're Jesus followers. And for a Jesus follower, we do believe there is a right and a wrong, and we believe that God makes that call because he's God. He tells us to hate what he calls evil and cling to what he calls good because our God says that evil, wrong, <laughs> sin, hurts people, corrupts people, destroys them. We may not understand how yet, but he's God, guys. And how can you really love somebody if you don't hate the things that are going to hurt them? How can you love a friend if you don't hate the things that are going to corrupt him or her, right? Guys, love isn't real if it just stands by and tolerates wrong. Love isn't real if it stands by and watches passively as the one we love is torn away from God. So guys, are you flirting with evil or trying to hate it like God does? Do you want to be good or just be good enough to get a passing grade? Give yourself a score, right? I made it on time. <laughs> he skipped three lines. Number three, be eager to honor one another. More literally, honor one another above yourselves. Do you see that happening anywhere in our culture right now? We don't do honor real well unless it somehow helps us. But we're really good at dishonor. Years ago, I tried to start a movement. Instead of yo mama jokes, I would do yo mama compliments. It didn't catch on. Because we really... We're really good at dishonor. There's multiple forms of entertainment that center around dissing and shaming and canceling and tearing down. So if there's any part of you that wants to be countercultural, here's a great opportunity. Remember Paul tells us in verse 2 from Romans 12 to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be different. And being eager to give honor is a stand out different way to live. And it's a big deal to God. 
In fact, in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, God commands children to honor their father and mother, and it promises blessing, that you can live long and it will go well with you. When we honor up, blessings seem to come back down. And if there's any, uh, anyone in authority over you, which there is, and if you want blessings to come your way, which you do, then honor those over you. It's not selfish, it's practical, and it makes life better, and it makes you better at life. Imagine a family where the children honor the parents and the parents honor the Lord. Imagine a workplace where the employees honor the boss and the boss honors the Lord. Look for opportunities to praise others, even create them if necessary. Be eager to honor one another. How are you doing? Give yourself a score. You can keep those seconds. (laughs) Number four, never be lazy, work hard, serve the Lord enthusiastically. Guys, believe it or not, this is about as countercultural as it gets. Have you ever heard of quiet quitting? That's how they describe people who show up for work, but they do as little as they can get away with. Any of you guys do that? Did you know that violates our family rules? And then have you heard of, of, of resenteeism? That's kind of a new one, but it describes people who hate their job, but they feel stuck. They need the money so they can't quit. Does that describe any of you guys? Paul says, never be lazy. That's countercultural. He says, work hard, which is kind of countercultural. And he says, whatever you're doing, do it like you're serving God, which is kind of weird. Guys, we Jesus followers ought to be the best bosses, best colleagues, best employees out there. Because like the Bible says in another place, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as though you're working for the Lord and not for people. We Jesus followers don't drift through life. We have a zest for life. Guys, when you see your work as serving God, it's going to make all of the difference. If you're serving anyone else, you'll start slacking. If you're serving anybody else, you'll be like, I'm working like a dog. Nobody's noticing. Nobody's appreciating what I do. No one says thank you. But if you're serving God, you know he knows, he honors, so others don't need to. So guys, they don't need to beg us to work hard. We are self-motivated. They don't need to monitor our work. We do our best. So how are you doing? Never be lazy. Work hard. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Give yourself a score. Two seconds over. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Give yourself a score. Uh, I've got to go fast on this next one. Number five, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Those are words that don't go together. Joyful in hope makes sense. Faithful in prayer is challenging, but it's sensical. But patient in affliction, how can Paul possibly expect that to work? Look at it this way. Everyone experiences difficulty in life. We live in a broken world. Everyone's carrying a load of problems. But for the believer, we don't handle it according to the pattern of this world, which is blame shifting and arguing and self-medicating and destructing and rage. Be different. Handle hard things in life with patience. Pursue lightness. Now, the only way that you can do this is if you live in view of God's mercy. If God's mercy is in view, then troubles don't win. A Christ-centered life keeps an eye on hope, joyful in hope. A Christ-centered life can endure troubles with patience. A Christ-centered life can remain faithful even when the odds are against them. And this isn't some sort of a passive interest. This is a tenacious grip on faith. This looks like a person who is sold out on following Jesus. So sold out that they let Jesus influence every part of their life. So rather than venting, be praying. Rather than drinking or self-destructing or self-medicating, be praying. Rather than posting and commenting, be praying. And invite God in. Transfer your burdens to the Lord. It may mean things that are not okay, or are not okay, but you can still be okay. It, it may not mean things will change, but you will change. So when life is hard, be patient. Let your hope keep you joyful and pray. How are you doing? Give yourself a score. It's really hard for a Texan to talk fast, isn't it? I'm just saying. It is. It is. It's going to slip out at some point, some sort of weird twang or something. (laughs) It's going to happen. Give yourself a score, guys. You need to do that. Number six, be generous with outsiders, hospitable. I'm sorry, generous with insiders, hospitable with outsiders. Those are kind of like separate ideas, but I'm going to link them together. Dad says, when family needs help and you have the ability to help, do it. And pursue hospitality. In other words, don't just talk about love. Just do it, guys. Several big ideas. First, family first. Our generosity is always family first, then towards outsiders. God wants us to tend to, look out for, care for our one another's first. Now, we do try to take care of outsiders, but family first. 
Listen, the way we take care of each other will look weird to people out there, but the church family is supposed to be the ultimate counterculture. Another big idea. Listen, guys, we don't give in order to get a blessing. We give because giving is the blessing. It's a one-way grace, kind of way the, the way God is with us. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, and we actually believe that. And then he says, pursue hospitality. Pursue is a strong word, and pursuing hospitality is not natural. If it was natural, we, he wouldn't have to tell us to do it. We see our homes as castles, right? A personal refuge instead of a tool to be used for our king. If you are a Jesus follower, your house is his house to be used in a way that honors him. A lot of you guys have been amazingly blessed by God, but do you, you live like those blessings are for you rather than for him? Do you show hospitality to outsiders or are you generous with insiders? Give yourself a score. It's hard to talk fast with an Oregon accent too, right? <laughs> we'll breathe later. All right. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Number seven, it feels like Doc is giving me all these crazy instructions, like he's trying to distance himself from some of these hard ones, right? This one is so crazy that Paul has to reinforce it and say it again. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. What kind of a fighter are you? Are you the type to throw the first punch? Or are you the type to wait, but then respond stronger? Maybe, maybe you aren't a fight starter, but you're a fight finisher. Paul says that Jesus' followers have a strategic counterpunch, grace. And this is so unnatural. This is actually miracle territory to be able to respond in such ways. Some people will call this behavior cowardice. The whole Christian idea of turning the other cheek, some view that as an act of cowardice. I've even heard good Christian men who take Jesus seriously struggle with turning the other cheek because they would rather offend Jesus than be a coward. You know what's, a, you know what's courageous? Returning insult with kindness. Counter-striking personal attacks with acts of grace. And if you don't believe me, view God's mercy. Jesus is hanging on a cross. His body is literally being destroyed for entertainment purposes. He's being mocked. There's laughter in front of his mother. And he prays for them. If there was ever a moment for war, creation is literally murdering their creator. And Jesus declared peace because Jesus knew the truth and the crowds didn't. He could have set them straight. But instead he says, bless and do not curse. Both are requests that we make to God. One is good, one is evil. A willingness to treat our enemies better than they deserve is an active witness to the mercy of our God. So how are you doing? Give yourself a score. When we get to the end of this, you can also give Ben a score, right? <laughs> Not me. I'm pretty sure I'm about perfect. <laughs> Number eight, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Which is harder for you? Is it harder for you to be happy with those who are happy or to weep with those who weep? Because usually we're better at one than the other. I'll bet you know two different kinds of people. You probably have a weeping friend who's always sad, always down. And if you tell them I'm having a bad day, they're going to be like probably not as bad as the day I'm having, right? Because their problems are always worse than yours. And they don't want to talk about your problems because their problems are always worse. If you're having a good day, they'll try to bring you down. I'm glad one of us is having a good day. And you probably have a happy friend. And sometimes they are annoyingly happy. They don't, they, they, you don't, they want to ruin your, your good day with, uh, the, I'm sorry, they don't want their pain, they don't want your pain to ruin their buzz. And they don't understand that sometimes it's okay to cry. Some of you guys are struggling. You're like, God works everything for good, right? Or greater who, than, is who that is in you that is in the world, which is true. Or sometimes they'll say something like, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And sometimes you just kind of want to throw them out that window, right? <laughs> God tells us to be both kinds of friend because it is not about us. Following Jesus requires that we live outside ourselves. If a friend is having a good day, we're happy for them, even if we're having a bad day. If a friend is having a bad day, we're going to hurt with them, even if we're having a great day. It's kind of like a ministry of presence. You're strong enough to focus on them and not on you. Give yourself a score. <laughs> He skipped a paragraph. <laughs> I'm scared right now that this whole shot clock thing... I win. Yeah, I guess. This whole shot clock thing is... People are going to want to keep this. I'm really nervous about it. Oh, goodness. <laughs> he did. This is a paragraph. Number nine. Don't treat people like they are beneath you. And don't think you know it all. And that makes sense if you live in view of God's mercy. 
but it doesn't make sense if you live by the laws of our culture. Rich people are up and poor people are down. Beautiful people are up. Others like me are down, okay? Famous people up, common people down, successful people up, normal people down. That's the way of our world. It's survival of the fittest, and it is a brutal way to live and a brutal culture to be a part of. Jesus did it differently. He was born in a small town. He had poor parents. He had a very modest job. Even as he becomes impressive in the community, everywhere that he goes, he didn't use his growing influence for his own benefit. In fact, he regularly faced criticism for being around those who were down and out. Paul says that in God's family, we don't overlook people who look like Jesus, which are the kind of people our culture tends to overlook. It connects really well to some of the stuff that we talked about last week. Don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think too lowly of yourself. In humility, see yourself with sober judgment. And if you want to do this well, it's going to require some wisdom. Humility requires wisdom. Wisdom recognizes that you don't know everything. Wisdom listens before speaking. Wisdom welcomes others into your life to speak truth to you. Wisdom does not coexist with pride. It does not coexist with conceit. Our, cult, our culture, man, struggles here big time, and so do many in the church. What about you? How are you doing? Give yourself a score. He skipped a paragraph. Too. No, I did not. <laughs> Very nope. first paragraph. Nope. Number 10, never return evil for evil, but do what people know to be good. Guys, this is about as countercultural as it gets, because when someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. In fact, if someone hurts us, we think it's good to hurt them back. It's what they deserve. But did you know that evil cannot conquer evil any more than demons can cast out demons? Evil breeds evil, right? So dad says, don't stoop to their level. Instead, respond in a way that all good people can back you. Bottom line, when someone hurts us, we tend to take our eyes off of God and to focus on the one who hurt us. We forget that God is watching, and we're God's kids, and like father, like sons and daughters. It's hard, but sometimes we Jesus followers forget who we are and what we stand for when people do us wrong. And you do understand, right, that people are watching you too. Those we're trying to nudge towards Jesus are watching us. Those who look up to us are watching us. Guys, you're discipling your kids and your friends. And when someone hurts us and we attack back, we're training our kids and friends to do evil. Guys, this is harder today than ever before because of social media. Because now you can hurt somebody from a distance. Now you can vilify, malign, or attack someone from a distance. Someone hurts you and all you have to do is punch a couple of keys. And so we say things about people that we would never say to their face because we're cowards, right? Right? Guys, this is going to take the Holy Spirit's help. This is not natural. It's God's way and we're God's family. Don't conform to the world's way. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how are you doing? Never returning for evil for evil. Give yourself a score. Number 11. <laughs> this is a fun one. If it's possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There's a lot of responsibility on us here, but it starts with some caveats, which is a little reassuring. The reality is you can't create peace. Conflict and peace both require two parties. You can only live in peace to the extent that you're willing to invest in peace. And someone reciprocates. You can't control the other party and make decisions for them, but that doesn't remove the responsibility from your end. So all you can do is your part. You can own your part of the conflict, or you can forgive the person who has offended you. This challenge from Paul is all about whether or not you are owning your part as far as it depends on you. If conflict is continuing on, is it because you haven't owned your part or is it because you haven't forgiven the other party? That's your role in every conflict. Are you working to create peace so long as it depends on you? And the reality is you can't live at peace with everyone. There's gonna be some who will never participate in peacemaking or peacekeeping, but God won't judge you for their behavior. It takes two people to fight. It takes one person to begin a path of peace. Are you a peacemaker or a conflict creator? God knows, and you probably do too. How are you doing with peace? Give yourself a score. Man, I didn't write that one well. That's too much time. I get 10 seconds yep. of his. Yep. Right? <laughs> you can pass it backwards to the previous one. <laughs> Make sure you're scoring yourselves, guys. Number 12, leave revenge to God. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. This is kind of like the never return evil for evil, but it is so unnatural, so hard, the dad kind of steps it up. Leave revenge to him. Instead, show agape, and that's weird. Leave revenge to God. You know why? Because we're not good at it. 
We always want to hurt someone back a little more than they hurt us so we can teach them a lesson. That's what we tell ourselves. Actually, the truth is we don't trust God. We want his grace for us, but not for the person who hurts us. We want truth for them. So when we are hurt, it's kind of like someone's got to do something. And God is like, you're right. I'll handle it. And we're like, no, God. Somebody needs to dispense justice right here, right now. And God says, trust me, I've got it. And we're like, God, they're getting away with it. And God is saying, would you just shut up and trust me, right? It's an act of faith to trust that God, the God who dealt with your sin will deal with theirs too. But guys, God is God. God is perfect. God is good. God knows things that we don't, and God has a plan, and someday you will be amazed at how perfect his plan is. See, there are two ways that God dispenses justice, either at the cross of Jesus or in hell. If you're a Jesus follower, Jesus died in the cross in your place for your sins. He endured the wrath of God for you so the grace of God could be given to you. If we reject Jesus, we will stand before him as judge at the end and receive justice. God has it covered. Leave revenge to God. So how are you doing leaving revenge to God? Give yourself a score. That one was close. All right. Number 13, this is the last one. It's from verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This verse feels like a summation of all of the different instructions, similar, similar to where we started in verse 9. We started with this idea of love must be sincere. We finished with do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a heart issue here. One of my favorite genres of movies is revenge. Two of my favorites are The Count of Monte Cristo and The Punisher. I love the long story of slowly exacting revenge over those who have hurt you. It's a truly dark part of my soul. So I can understand how it feels good when an enemy has a bad day. And I get how it feels bad when an enemy has a good day. That makes sense in our secular thinking, but it doesn't make sense in view of God's mercy. It doesn't make sense if we're called to not conform to the patterns of this world. Instead, it's evidence of our brokenness. Our soul is sour. So don't let evil defeat you. It will if you don't live in view of God's mercy. Instead, overcome evil with good. Our world, our world just treats evil with more evil and stronger evil and faster and more powerful evil. Don't play those games. Live in view of God's mercy. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Overcome evil with good. How are you doing on that one? Give yourself a score. Have you scored yourself? Those are some of the big ones, guys. Those are some of our family rules, and they are not negotiable. Don't fake love. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be eager to honor one another. Never be lazy. Work hard serving the Lord enthusiastically. Life is hard, so be patient and let your hope lead to joy and keep praying. Be generous with insiders. Show hospitality to outsiders. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Don't treat people like they are beneath you. Never return evil for evil. Do what people know to be good instead. So far as it is, depends on you, be at peace with all people. Leave revenge to God. And don't let evil defeat you, but conquer evil with good. How are you doing? Which ones are the toughest for you? In fact, can you spot your lowest scores? And if you can't identify what you're bad at, ask your husband or your wife. They'll tell you what you're bad at, right? They probably know. Here's your assignment. Highlight the ones that you need to work on. Might be different for each of you. And then get started. On Monday, do something different. On Tuesday, so do something different. And if you mess up, ask for God's forgiveness and try again. Listen, guys, it is worse than worthless to know what God wants you to do, to agree that it's what you ought to be doing, and then to keep on doing the same old. These instructions are not that hard to understand, but they're really hard to do. But guys, we're Jesus followers, and God's Spirit is inside of you helping you, so let's be different. It'll make you better at life, and it'll make your life better. And so maybe this leads you to needing some sort of a conversation, uh, whether that's uh, just asking for prayer, whether, whether you need to know what your next steps may be in trying to be a follower of Jesus. Both of those are legitimate questions and worth conversations. Uh, maybe you'd like to go back to our room over your right shoulder in the back of the room. We have a 
prayer room set up where we have an elder who's been praying for you during this whole service, and he would be willing to pray with you if that's what you need. Maybe it's time for you to make a decision to be serious about following Jesus. These rules are weird. It sounds like rules, but it makes sense in view of God's mercy. It all starts at the cross and what he did for us. Because of that, it leads us to want to pursue something so wild and so different. So if you want to have that conversation, we'd love to have that one too. Whatever you may feel called to do, let the Spirit lead you. Why don't you stand and let me pray for us real quick. God, we thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you that you love us, that you loved us first, that in your mercy you cared for us. And God, as we have this family meeting, God, I pray that it would not be overwhelming to us in a sense of duties or chores that we have to do, but that we would see that this is just how we live as a family because it's how you live. It's because of who you are. And so God, even as it's hard to do, may we stare at your son and see the example he set before us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.